As the official healthcare provider of Minnesota United, Alina Health is focused on keeping our loons in top condition. And with expertise in orthopedics, sports medicine, heart care, and more, Alina has the team to keep your family in the game too. The experts at Alina Health take the time to get to know you as a whole person, helping you achieve wellness for your mind, body, and spirit. It's an altogether better kind of healthcare. Learn more at alinahealth.org. Everybody and welcome back to another episode of Sound of the Loons presented by Alina Health. And this time it's a really special episode because we get to talk to two people at one time. It doesn't always happen because, you know, sometimes we feel like we're stepping on each other, but this is like a free flowing podcast. So I get to be joined by Zarek Valentin, veteran, renaissance man, outside defender, outside back, wing back, leader of the team um all things encompassing and then also dr megan miller from alina health as well and we'll get into titles we'll get into like the history and what it means to be a part of mental health awareness because that's what we're going to really dive into this week which is the most important aspect and i first of all thank you both for joining me i appreciate you guys taking the time everybody's insanely busy we've got these crazy schedules with games coming up so i appreciate you both taking the time yeah, thank you so much for having me personally. I'm excited to to chat and to to learn and and just to, to share some experiences with you guys. Yeah, perfect. I agree. Any well, chance to I, talk about mental health. Exactly. You know, and I, I sh- I'm going to give Dr. Megan Miller the, the proper title here of clinical psychologist and director of well-being and culture at Alina Health. Is that correct? Did I nail that? You nailed it. Okay, good. Because last week I had Angie Blaker on, and I don't think I have a title long enough for her um, for all that she does with with Minnesota United, as Eric can probably can probably preach to. But um, I think this is a, an incredibly timely topic. It's kind of like a lot of things where we talk about. Yes, you have a mental health awareness game that we label right for Wednesday against Houston Dynamo, Minnesota United. But also, this is a much bigger, all encompassing aspect because this isn't something that should just be talked about at one day or one month or one week. This is something that we're really trying to focus on year round is mental health and what that means for all people in all aspects of their life. We're going to focus a little bit on you, Zarek, and sort of the professional athlete aspect, the the husband aspect, the dad aspect, the growing up aspect, um, and even dealing with it with our children now and what that means. And then Dr. Mike and Miller just chime in and, and we'll kind of go around the horn here about the things that you see in life and how to sort of navigate these things. So first and foremost, Eric, just give us a little lowdown on your your career path. You've been in the league for a long time. You've played overseas as well, but sort of the ups and downs and the nature of the mental capacity that that being a professional athlete encompasses. Where do we start? How much time do we have? Um, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, so I um, grew up in Pennsylvania, Went to high school in IMG, Florida, and then went to college at the University of Akron in Ohio. After that, I was fortunate enough to be drafted to a team called Chivas USA, which unless you are a diehard MLS fan, you maybe may not know who they are. So I was at Chivas for one year, went to Montreal, where I met my wife, and then I was uh, went on loan for three years in Norway to the Arctic Circle. Um, and that was where I think uh, mental health first and foremost became a lot more prevalent in terms of being in a foreign country, being above the Arctic Circle, circle, where in January you have 45 minutes of sunlight, and in June you have 23, uh, three, 23 and a half hours of sunlight. So seasonal depression was huge there, right? So a lot of these things that I wasn't really, you know, I was living in a little bit of a bubble. Oh, we're in Los Angeles and Hermosa Beach. This is awesome. And suddenly you go to Buda, which is super high, um, super high in Norway. And suddenly, you know, the teachers are going through seasonal depression when their kids don't get good grades in class. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is a lot different um, than, than it might be in America. So living there um, was an interesting experience. And also going to Portland, Oregon after that, uh, I played for the Timbers for four years. Um, I was in Houston for three. And now thankfully, and very happily, I'm in Minnesota um, doing my best to acclimate myself here. But I would say in terms of just general things, being a professional athlete is very tough mentally. And if you don't, 
figure out ways to cope and figure out ways to get through the day to day. Um, sometimes the the minute by minute in the games, um, it can be very difficult. So thankfully I've developed some strategies along the way to help myself. And um, now that I'm a little bit older, help my teammates maybe in some difficult moments as well. So Dr. Miller, when you hear, and you've been around the the whole concept of mental health, clearly you're, you know, in your own aspect of life, but then also once you decided to go into the profession that you chose, but how has the definition, the perception, and even how you view mental health as a psychologist, how has that changed over time? Yeah, you know, that's exactly what I was actually thinking about as you were talking, Sarah, because the the needs, um, like human need has just become so we've shed so much light on that. And I think COVID, um, if I'm going to offer a silver lining of COVID, that might be the one is that when we talk about what is mental health, what does mental health look like? What's our definition of mental health? It used to be more so the conversation would really over index on the side of the continuum that was really about mental illness. So diagnosable conditions and symptoms that impacted functioning. And what happened through COVID was that this conversation started to emerge of what does mental health actually look like? What does it mean to be healthy mentally and what goes into that? And this recognition and understanding that it's, you know, for example, when we say the word well-being, people kind of immediately associate that with physical well-being. Well, that definition has gotten really more robust and we've had a lot of support from people like the U.S. Surgeon General who have offered different advisories and frameworks to really think about what's that broader uh, definition of what that looks like. So it's financial well-being, it's physical well-being, it's nourishing your career path, it's your connection and your community. And so I think just when I hear you talk, Eric, that's what I think of is our definition has gotten way more robust. We've really embraced this concept of mental health and all that it entails. And with that, um, it's kind of a tall order. It's a lot of work. That's a great point because I do think in the past and maybe the, as you stated, the silver lining of COVID was that we reevaluated mental health and that everybody can experience it in different levels and in some way, shape or form, not just the mental illness or the stereotypes of the things, the stigmas, I should say, Mm -hmm. that went along with that in the past and maybe why it is more part of an everyday conversation. So even when you're looking at that and Zarek and and sort of your trials and tribulations, and we could talk specifically about, you know, professional sports, but even just as a human being, what sort of tools have you been able to develop to navigate some of those moments and those challenges of the high pressure situations, the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows that go along, not just with your career, but just sort of with life in general, have you developed any specific tools and how you navigate those? I think the biggest development was my wife. <laughs> um my wife uh, um, has worked in pediatric psychiatry for a few years now. Um, so the concept of it's okay not being okay in certain moments has really entered the fray um, a lot more than it maybe would have when I was living alone. Um, and I was always a little bit more emotionally closed off than my wife was. So a lot of times it was, hey, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm great. And then now it might be, I'm not doing as well because of X, Y, and Z. So I used to mask a lot of my feelings, but over the, the years, it's taken, it, it's practice, it's work. Um, but I've realized that through going through some of the motions, through finding someone who you're comfortable talking about with, whether that is your wife or your best friends, or whether it's someone you don't even know, you know, finding whatever outlet it might be, um, for me was really crucial in terms of managing some of the moments, because as a professional athlete in the transition to that sense, Um, The biggest thing I've seen over the change of my career has been the power and the voice of social media. Um, The effect it has on players day in and day out is a lot higher than people will um, give it credit for. And when I was a young guy in the league, I was there. Twitter came out my rookie year, 2011, I think, or 2010. Right. So you're talking it was no one knew what it was. Media wasn't that big at all. And now we play a game there's player ratings on social media there's did you you know the mistakes there are videos immediately if you make uh if you score a goal great you might be buzzing if you slip in the back and you give up a goal then that's everywhere right that's on mls wrap up that's on 360 they're talking about it it's everywhere so that's a lot to deal with um and that is something that i think a lot of players have had um difficulty navigating because as much as it's um, easy to say, oh, I'm not going to look at social media. It drags you back in and it gets you going. And I've seen people and I'm like, turn it off. Don't look, don't do it because it's only going to be bad and we will handle things internally and we'll go from there. So I think there's there's been a lot of coping mechanisms that every individual player has had to develop over the course of 
their careers because of just how prominent and how easily accessible good moments are and how easily accessible bad moments are. And everybody's a keyboard social media warrior. You know what I mean? That that's like a real thing. And I, I believe, Dr. Miller, we talked about this a little bit last year. And you were like, don't get me started <laughs> on social media and what kind of an impact that has on the world we live in. What mm-hmm. is the biggest challenge that you've been presented with in specifically in regards to social media and what it can do to we talk about youth and adolescents, but I mean it's adults, it's across the board. I mean, no one mm-hmm. is immune to those kinds of feelings and emotions, no matter how much you try to maybe block it out. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest challenge is it's um, purposely structured to be addictive, right? Mm -hmm. And so the way it engages us and our brains is to suck us in and to keep us going back for more and more and more. And when the content, as you said, there fluctuates so much between positive and negative, it's like you can't put your own filters up, right? There's no Instagram filter, like only show me the good stuff. You know, it's just, (laughs) right? It's just, it's all right there. And so I think that to me is the biggest challenge, um, a particular challenge for youth because of just where they're at development, developmentally, but um, it does not prevent us as adults from being impacted from that. And, um, you know, I think it's so interesting uh, if I take the lens of a professional athlete, because in one hand, there's this huge opportunity here to have this positive impact and to stand behind a mission or you know, for, from my vantage point as a mental health professional, I'm like all the athletes who talk about mental health become instantly my favorite athletes. They just like rise to the top because it does so much to chip away at, at the stigma that is really pervasive in this field. And so there's the opportunity there, but the impact then is when you open yourself up in that way, you're opening yourself up to a really large crowd with a lot of opinion and a lot of feedback. And so one of the skills that I really hone in on for anybody who will listen to me chatter about this is the self-awareness piece of knowing like what's happening to you internally as you're taking in this information, you're being exposed to just the elements of the world. The more you can tune in to something's off and then have that, that group that you feel comfortable saying something's off, uh, that generally is a pretty good step one. How often have you heard you know, wow, I had no idea. You know what I mean? And and, you, and sometimes only the the headline grabbing news stories get our attention, right? When you hear something that someone's, ne- I had no idea they were going through this. I had no idea they felt this way because oftentimes, like to your point, Zarek, we can put up this kind of front. Like if you're even if somebody as close as your wife is asking you, hey, how are things going? How's your day? Being able to accept to yourself that maybe you're just not okay let alone voicing that thought to others, because you hear these news stories that come up and, you know, usually they're, they don't end well. And even people around them, the closest people had no idea that that person was feeling that way. Or maybe they're very much like this, which, you know, up and down, which is all normal mm-hmm. too. But we're trying to normalize that. We're trying to make that okay. And then it's also okay to have those moments where you're like, wow, this sucks. But like, how do you then climb out of it? You know, and I've had that conversation with people that, I, you know, friends and family and people that I know that have gone through difficult times, whether it's an illness or something else. It's okay to have your moment to be like, wow, what the heck? You know, why me? Why me? This or whatever you might be dealing with. But then how do you climb out of that moment and what tools do you use to get out of it and who do you lean on? So it's kind of like this crazy effect that we're seeing. And and so how often... Have you felt that way, Dr. Miller? And and Zarek, how often do you even deal with that with teammates? Because if you're going to ask someone how how they're doing, you got to be ready for the real answer too, if you want to be someone that they can lean on. You don't just want the token, everything's okay and we move on our way. You have to be ready sometimes to, to hear what the person has to say. Yeah, for me personally, it's been uh, something I've instituted the past, I'd say two years especially, is checking in with teammates. And not just a few... Will Trap, uh, guys went to college with. No, no, across the spectrum, because I'm luckily enough, I can speak English and Spanish and basically migrate between a lot of different pockets in the locker room, checking in with guys. And I think it's easy um, to talk to players when they're in form and when they're starting, right? Typically, you can kind of say, hey, this guy's going to be in a pretty good mood. You can see people switch. Oh, I'm starting this week. I'm a little chipper. And then if someone doesn't necessarily play or then will – um, go into a space in which maybe they get pulled from the lineup. 
or they miss a few chances and then they get pulled. That's for me an immediate red flag in terms of, hey, maybe just go ask how they're going, how they're doing. And it might be asking once or twice, but I think thankfully I've developed enough of a rapport with a lot of my teammates to where they know they can be a little bit vulnerable. And for me, I, I, I understand that that's part of my role in the locker room as one of the older guys that's seen a lot, that's been through a lot of situations in life to be that sounding board. Because a lot of times men especially want to be strong and we are told that we need to be fierce and never show weakness. And even in a game, for example, the psychological aspect as an outside back, I'm supposed to never show that I'm even tired. I'm not even supposed to stretch my muscles. I'm not supposed to get water. I'm supposed to look as fit as possible so that my winger doesn't feel like he has any edge on me. Right. So it starts at that level and you can kind of break it down. So I'm, we're supposed to be in this situation where it's okay, but I've realized that a lot of guys actually want to speak to their teammates about their frustration with uh, their current form, with the the coaching decisions, whatever it might be, because maybe they don't want to speak to a superior about it. So someone on the same level might help. And for me, I've tried to just be a little, a lot more of a sounding board to my teammates and, and willing to go through some of those tough stories, right? Because sometimes it's not just, hey, I didn't score. It might be, Hey, some, something's not right at home. Hey, my wife and I have been going through a lot of fights. Okay. And that's a deeper level issue. Let's talk. Cause no one, not, no one's perfect. And we all want to achieve the same goal. And I want to be a good friend to you and help you in, in every life, because that's just, I care about you. And that's mainly what I want to get across to a lot of my teammates. Dr. Miller, do you have kind of any, any insight onto the same kind of feedback and, and sort of things that you've seen and trying to really push to People and and if you deal with children more than parents or parents more than children or groups, what what's the communication like there? You know, for parents to feel comfortable talking to their children, children feeling comfortable talking to their parents. We're talking about teammates with Zarek, but even within a family dynamic, like sometimes, you know, the parents and the kids in your separate meetings might be talking about the same thing, but they haven't felt comfortable coming together. How do you bridge that gap? Yeah, that happens a lot. <clears throat> I think you probably see that happen on you know, teams too. It's like, you know, like, I think we can all probably resonate with that feeling where it's like, I really want to talk or say something. And it's just like, it's hard to take that leap. And it's because it's vulnerable. And um, really the act of being vulnerable is we kind of open ourselves up to somebody without a guarantee in terms of what the reaction is going to be, right? So that can introduce at least the opportunity to be hurt. And that sometimes is enough for us to feel reserved. Um, with all those different groups, I would say um, the one piece of feedback and something that I am very conscious about uh, when anybody is uh, kind of opening up is that you don't have to have the answer. I think a lot of times we put a lot of pressure on ourselves feeling like if I ask somebody how they're doing or if I put myself in a position to help another individual, then I better have the answer. And actually more often than not, not having the answer is what makes that connection deeper because really what you need to have is empathy versus an answer. If you attempt to solve someone's problem, it actually can create this interesting dynamic where it actually invalidates the person's experience where it's like, well, okay, well, you've got it all figured out. I must really be out of sorts if I can't even see my way through this. But for someone to show up and be like, yeah, that's really hard. You know, I, I don't have the answer because that's like, a, you know, a deep situation. Here's a situation where I've been in, where I felt something very similar. And just to be in that moment with the person actually, uh, and there's a, a bunch of research to kind of back this up, that, that seems to be the, the tipping point for those interactions and those connections. That's different than if we just kind of jump in with solution after solution, after solution that tends to drive people a little bit away. Um, and then specifically like one thing with parent, you mentioned parents, Kendra, um, I always recommend decreasing eye contact if you want to increase communication. So take a side-by-side -side walk, go for a drive. Eye contact is actually really intimidating in terms of a human interaction. It's just like mm. you're looking into my soul kind of thing. So, um, and you might even find this like Zarek on the team, like going on a run or whatever it might be that tends to facilitate some more communication because the interpersonal risk tends to come down a little bit. So that's a little tip and trick from the mental health world. That's actually a fantastic point because we always assume if someone's not looking you in the eye that they're not listening. But in those moments, in those situations, sometimes it might be easier as you're stating to go for a walk, to do whatever. And it's funny that you say that because I'm on the way to school this morning. 
my daughter sits in the back seat, you know, behind me. And all of a sudden she's like, mom, what's the worst thing that's happened to you ever at school? Do you remember a time where like someone was mean to you or someone wouldn't talk to you, you know, and, and you're trying to like keep it light and, you know, and she's only nine, mm-hmm. but I'm like, why did something happen? You know, and you want her to like open up, but, but cause they, sometimes she'll feel like she's in trouble. You know what I mean? So it's just her being behind me rather than being me like, Let's sit down and look at each other and hash this out. You know, that's a great point. I've never thought about that way. Zarek, have you found that? Or like now looking back, you're like, wow, that actually totally makes sense with each individual might be different, but you've had that experience. Well, I think uh, maybe without thinking it so directly, we sit in lockers, right? So we don't sit and face each other while we're drinking coffee. We sit in our lockers and maybe we'll sit there and have a cup of coffee and kind of look over a little bit, but it's not as intimate as like a picnic where you guys are sitting down and doing that. Um, and I would say where I have noticed that, which maybe I can, you know, take that into my own life is with my son. Um, and at times we go through things where um, we're learning to be parents, right? You're going through moments and no one has this magical recipe. You can wave a wand and it's always perfect. Um, but interesting when it comes to um, settling him down or disciplining him or whatever it might be, the eye contact part is definitely, you kind of see eyes wander. So that, uh, that was a really interesting point that I'm going to take home. I'm going to write that one down. In the book. I, I, I know like that my that. kids uh, listen to this one because then they're going to know my secret. No, I, li- I like that one. But I would say at least in terms of soccer stuff, um, even even in, even when you're passing, right? Let's say in warmups and when you go out early with somebody and you go and have a chat, because a lot of times it's you're doing finishing or it's very casual. You're not necessarily making it this very intimate interaction where you're sitting there and expecting someone to verbal diarrhea all their problems like, oh, this is what's going on. So it's um, not, that's an incredible tip that I'm going to take into my own life. And my teammates start seeing it. Now. I'm going to start bringing sunglasses <laughs> in the locker. I do like too, because I think that, you know, as much as um, it's just listening sometimes to your point about not having the answer, you know, I mean, I think acknowledging what someone is saying makes you feel like, makes them feel like you're listening and you're hearing them, but not needing the answer per se. And I mean, this is across the board. I mean, this is the same kinds of things. I get these emails called all pro dad, even though I'm the mom, like it's part of, it's part of this thing that the school does and the tips and tricks in there for marriages, for communication, for your children, for building character, making people feel confident, working on, you know, things. It never ends in life. This isn't just, a thing that you're trying to master in elementary school when you're dealing with bullies and cliques and and mean girls this is something that we can take into our everyday life mm-hmm. as adults and will it'll never stop so i think at the end of the day when you even look ahead now what what can you do zarek what have you done how do you feel like you can best contribute to the next generation, to your own generation, even that is now really embracing mental health in and around the league, in and around just wherever you go. How do you view your role in this going forward? Well, I've always said that as athletes, we're, we're given a platform, whether we like it or not. And then it's your choice to either use it for good or for bad or just to self-promotion, whatever you want to do. No problem. And again, each, it's each their own. Um, people will typically fall into a lane in which they feel most comfortable with. But for me, I feel the need with my social media to then promote concepts and ideas that will make, you know, the world more inclusive will make, you know, bring to light um, mental health and to do things along those lines. And for me personally, it's just going to be trying to, um, I would say lessen the stigma about people. It's like, it's okay not being okay. And that's, that's fine. And we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable at times. Right. And then man, all these cliches, but it, but it's all true though. Right. Um, and, and I think when, you know, people might look to professional athletes or people in positions of uh, like a sport, like a sports person or someone that they might look up to, to see that they're not okay, or they've been through struggles or to, to show like a little bit more of a human side, as opposed to I've scored 20 goals and I do, and I'm never wrong. No, like that's, you know, you're letting people know that you're, you go through the same struggles and you're a little bit more relatable because no one is perfect. And I think that Social media wants us to be perfect. They want us to put out the me with showing abs and that'll get the most likes, right? As opposed to if you put a photo of you, you know, going through some of your times and, and humanizing yourself a bit, that might not get the recognition and the, you know, the 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 social media response 
in which other pictures might, but it's it's more important because those things will, will lead to people being in a better state and to be more relatable to the fans and to the people that, you know, pay their hard-earned money and spend their time to support us. And on the field is something important to myself. So for me personally, it's to continue to, to talk about and many, many of these things that the league is pushing forward and a lot of these topics that have become so prevalent, which is awesome, but we need to keep doing that even past this month. It can't just be one conversation. It has to be something that we, you know, attack on a daily basis or let's start at a week, weekly basis. And then we can kind of narrow it down because ultimately it's going to better our health um, on and off the pitch or in the office or outside of the office. And I always think those little check-ins are just important too. I mean, I even have, you know, a group of friends that, even if you interact with them and text is hard to understand, sometimes text is hard to read and understand what someone is meaning, which we've all found, which you probably all sent to receive the text before where you take it the wrong way. But in general, you usually have sort of a pulse on people that are closest to you, even in the way they might respond, even if it's a text message. And it's just like, hey, all good, everything okay. And they can divulge what they want, but you're opening yourself up for that conversation for them to feel comfortable. And I feel like it can just be those everyday little moments. And then that person might be like, hey, I needed that today. You know, that was what I needed. That's what I needed to hear. That's what I appreciate you reaching out, all those kinds of things. And you never know what might be going on with each individual in their life, whether it's in the workplace, out of the workplace or whatever it might be. And Dr. Miller, I want to ask you a question, sort of what Zarek was talking about with social media. And I know we've talked about it a lot, but the the thing I find, and I'm not on Facebook or Instagram anymore. I used to be, and now I'm just on Twitter and I mostly do work stuff on there. I don't really do much, much else, but is there's people in your life that you might know that all they post on there is the sunny, rosy, glorious stuff that makes their life look like white picket fence. Perfect. And you know that that's not the case. And that's not the case with anybody. Everybody is going through something. But how do you combat some of that? This like sort of fake reality that we've all sort of created with with life on social media and what is maybe real, you know, how how do you how do you deal with that or how do you mesh that? How do you not, and I don't want to say fix because that's not the answer, but that's a, that's a challenge when, you know, we can't even perceive ourselves in a certain way and the way we're putting it out there publicly. Yeah, I mean, I think that speaks to just our broader culture um, and the the process of socialization. You know, we talked about it with like what it means to be a man, right? And you have to be strong and you don't show emotion. And, um, you know, especially, well, with all my kids, the mom of two boys and a girl, like that gets really prevalent. You start to really notice the social expectations that are being put on I think a lot of times we notice it with our youth, um, but then that can turn into that self-awareness of the expectations that are being put on us as parents, um, even the gender difference in that. What does it mean to be a dad? What does it be to mean to be a mom? We tend to expect moms to be more nurturing, dads to be the disciplinarian. Um, and again, I go back to that awareness piece of just understanding that that's what's happening is that this world is putting expectations out there and telling us who we have to be. And that allows us to then entertain the thought of, does it have to be who I am? Like maybe that, maybe that's not true for me and that's okay. And that's to your point, Eric, about it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be uncomfortable. It's also okay not to have a white picket fence. If you don't want a white picket fence, you know, like if that's not your jam, like as long as you have your community around you and feel supported, like that's the most important part. And so I feel like as a society, we need to kind of anchor back into what are my personal values? What's important to me? Is it important to me to have a certain type of house or to have a certain type of image or is what's important to me, um, you know, the connection I have and relationship I have with my family or my friends or whatever that might be. And I think that also helps address some of this culture of you're speaking to a Kendra of just do this. Like here, here's all your tips and tricks on communication. Here's all your tips and tricks for marriage and just do and do and do That's our attempt to try and like intellectualize our feelings. Right. And so it's like, well, if I'm feeling, you know, not seen or heard in my marriage, well, I'll just get a bullet point list and that will probably figure it out. No, you're probably going to have to sit in an uncomfortable moment with your partner and have a deep conversation about what's going on so they know exactly what's happening. And that's what I feel like we try to sidestep a little bit, but there's kind of no path but through. Um, and so I just, I keep kind of coming back to this awareness piece. The more we tune into 
what's going on for us, what we're taking in for information, how it's making us feel and what we want to do with it, the more we can kind of keep that stability. I want to end this thing on a positive, on an upbeat <laughs> feeling, right? Because it's a, it is a hard subject. It's a difficult subject. And to your point, like you want to, you know, you might have to be uncomfortable, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable with whether it's with someone else or with yourself or whatever that might be. So I want to know from each of you, what is the best thing that you've seen, the best recent memory of a situation, an environment, an example, a a communication, a text, an email, like some sort of moment, an aha moment, or whether it's you personally, or whether it's something that you've witnessed that you're like, wow, this is, this is awesome. We're making strides in, in mental health awareness. We are, you know, continuing on the uphill swing here. Is there any in particular moment and an example that you can give that just is like, you know, it, it's like a positive because at the end of the day, we want to be positive. We want to be fake positive, but we want to be positive and we want it, people to feel that energy because I do think it's incredibly contagious. And I know, Zarek, every single person I've talked to in Minnesota United, and I also interviewed you with you when you were at Houston. I know you're from Portland, but everybody at Minnesota United that I've talked to has talked so highly of you and your energy and your attitude and your leadership and your guidance. I talked to DJ last week about you know, at halftime, giving him feedback and helping him through the moments on the field. So, you know, I know that 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 is the way that you operate. And some days we don't all want to be chipper and happy, but, you know, you bring that energy, you bring that positivity. What is a moment and an example that you can say, this was this was good. We're making we're making good strides on mental health here. Oh, man, <laughs> I appreciate the kind words. Um, there's a, there's a lot to uh, to pick from. Um, for me, it's just little, I would say little connections that, that happen each day. I think that the big one recently has been, I would say in terms of the mental health is Ray coming back. And I know this is a topic that has been difficult, but Ray's back in the fold and we, you know, we've had players meeting and we've gone back, we had a chat and then everyone leaves the meeting and it's like, all right, like, cool. Yeah. Does it, you know, does one meeting solve, you know, a few months? No, it's not going to be like that, but I could see a huge change from, you know, literally two days ago to now. And it's awesome. You should have, the energy on the field was contagious today. It was great. You know, so I'm hoping we can bring that in and get a big result tomorrow. But for me, it was, there was this lingering issue, right? Everyone talked about it. The media, everyone wanted to keep dangling this fruit. When's it going to happen? Cool. The apple fell, we got the apple, we've cleaned it off and now let's move forward. And now there's, we can leave that topic behind us. Now it's, you know, ex we're excited to see how fit and how fast fit he can get and how much he can get back to helping the team and to hear his words, to hear his emotion, to hear his, his genuineness when he came and talked to us was awesome. And for me, that was a very big, I would say, burden off the shoulders of a lot of people in terms of having to talk about it, address it to the media. Now it's, Hey, let's just go play our football. You know, we's back. Let's have fun. Let's embrace him. Give him a little bit of stick because that's what teammates do. And then we'll go back out there and hopefully get some points. Can I just say on that too, and not specifically about Ray, but in general, like also in that large group of people, not everybody may want to feel the same way about it and to have the same feeling about it. And it's the same way in anything in life, you know, like, and the media is asking every day, right. And that doesn't happen necessarily in every other job, but not everyone has to have the same feeling about a situation. And so then mm -hmm. it's finding that common ground or how do you all move together? It, you voice your different feelings and your different opinions in any situation, but then how do we move forward from that? And I, so I love that example because that is a great, perfect example. And it's timely in the situation, but it is about those different opinions and those different feelings and it coming together. And then how do we move forward? Because if you can't move forward, you keep reliving things in the past. That's not, that's not healthy for anybody in any relationship. Of how course. about you, Dr. Miller? Give me, give me a, I'll All put right. you positive I'll one in on here. <laughs> um, well, in addition uh, to working in the space of mental health, we have, we are huge loons fans and we actually have season tickets. And so we are at a particular game uh, where there may have been a controversial allocation of stoppage time and <laughs> a very late goal. And we, we bring our three kids and they're of the age where emotional regulation is very difficult. And so as soon as that happened, 
my husband and I locked eyes and we were like, oh boy, <laughs> this, this isn't going to land well <laughs> with the kids. Our middle son in particular, who uh, just, he gets really upset really fast when things don't really go his way. And we just watched and we just observed and just sat with it for a second. And he pops up and he goes, I do not like that that happened, but sometimes those things happen. And that was it. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's happening. It's happening right before our eyes. It's, he's getting it. Um, and so it was, a, it was a, the best ending to a particularly difficult situation um, that we could have hoped for. So I love that, that was, example too, because even, I mean, you say he's of an age where emotional regulation is difficult. I'm not sure that that goes away, <laughs> especially when we're all witness to professional birth sports. to 55. I Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. So I love that example because that wouldn't even quote unquote didn't directly affect him. Right. But it's something he's emotional about and he's attached to. And if you saw any of the reactions on the pitch or from others, you know, everyone's feeling the same, the same I, way. I, I know how that one feels. <laughs> Exactly. Things always, that's a good, that's, that's why I do think those sports and things in life, sports can be sort of all encompassing life lessons because there's a lot of times where things don't go your way or you work really hard and you don't get what you want. I mean, that can happen across the board, but sports sort of sometimes encap encapsulates all those things mm -hmm. on one playing field on one, you know, level platform. You work really hard. You don't get what you want. Maybe you work really hard. You do earn what you get, you know? So I think those are great examples about um, controlling your emotions and feeling like you're making strides. And um, I just, I appreciate you guys both joining me today. I know everyone's insanely busy and mental health awareness is such an important topic. And I do, you know, I love that there's always a special day, a special week, a special month dedicated to it. But at the same time, practicing those same things every day in our lives, whether it's check-ins with people, whether it's how being more cognizant and mindful of what we post on social media, how we post it, and even just now in our daily communications with people, just making sure that we're being present, taking those tools and, and trying to really put them into place. So I appreciate you guys for taking the time and joining me today. Always Thanks fun. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Hey, everybody, uh, join us again next week. Another Sound of the Loons. We got, we'll have two games to discuss. We didn't do any breakdown, breakdown, breakdown this week on Sound of the Loons of Minnesota United, but we'll, we'll have two games uh, to catch up on next week after a busy week and a busy month of May for Minnesota United. So check in next week. Thanks, everybody.